thank you. Good morning, Gordon College. It's a privilege to share with you. Um, I'll be continuing to look at the Sermon on the Mount, so if you want to get your Bibles out to Matthew 5, I'll be reading from verse 38 on, if you want to do that now. Um, I may be mistaken, but I think there was a ball game last night. Yankees, Yankees have issues. Um, I've been a Boston Red Sox fan since 1967, if you can believe that, the impossible dream. I was in middle school, they actually took us out of class and put us in the auditorium to watch the game on TV. In middle school, I am not kidding. Um, but yeah, I'm disappointed because I will no longer have the Red Sox to keep me company on my late rides home. I'll have to depend on the Celtics and the Patriots and the Bruins, but I think I'll get through it. Um, so let me read from Matthew, again, I'll be reading from the NIV. You have heard that it was said, eye for eye and tooth for tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. If someone wants to sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. If someone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. You've heard it, that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? And if you greet only those who are your brothers, what are you doing more than, than, other, than, um, than others? Even the pagans do that. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. The Sermon on the Mount is a masterpiece. It's also ridiculously unreasonable. And Jesus is doing a device, kind of like Martin Luther King did with the I Had a Dream. He's using a refrain. And he does it five times. He says, you've heard it was said, but I tell you. Y'all thought this was what was on point, but let me explain it to you. You think you've got it going on with this, but you ain't seen nothing. It'd be kind of like someone come up to me and say, you know, Bill, I've been working out and I can do 20 push-ups. And I'd be like, you need to be able to do 20 times 20, one-armed, <laughs> while driving, <laughs> a stick shift, <laughs> over ice, blindfolded. That's what I'm talking about. And, and we tend to look for, give me the rules. Just give me the actual rules. It's kind of like an IRS tax code, which I've had to actually read. Oh, bad. And Jesus is saying, no, it's not about that. It's about principles, value, character. It's not about what you do. It's how you figure out what you do. And that's much harder, isn't it? Now, the expressions Jesus gives are kind of culturally nuanced. Um, so we don't quite get the full scope. It'd be kind of like if I said to you, I, I worked my butt off preparing the sermon. No one here thinks I had a derriere <laughs> Right? Y'all know that's an expression. And so when Jesus said these things, the people who heard them kind of knew what that meant. The cloak and the mile thing, those were about legal requirements uh, in the courts or with the Romans. And it's basically saying, don't just do the minimum. Go above and beyond what you're required to do. Maybe a way that I'd apply that is you're supposed to tip between 15 and 20, tip at 25. You know, just push it up a little bit more. But I want to talk about the right hand, the right cheek slap. And some of you have probably heard this, but let's, let's just hypothetically, if the slapper and slappy are facing each other, and the slapper is right-handed, which would have been a pretty good assumption, and the slapper is slapping the right cheek, there's only one way that can happen. It can't be one of these slaps, which could actually hurt. It's got to be like this, which is a sign of disrespect. There's another term for it I won't use. It's not an intent to actually physically injure. It's an attempt to emotionally injure. It's disrespect. And when someone disrespects us, our first instinct is to bring it. Oh, I can tell you a couple things, too. Let me break that down. Oh, yeah? And how about, right? 
And it's really hard for us not to want to just respond in kind. And Jesus is saying, don't respond in kind. Now, I struggled a lot as to whether I was going to share this story, but God won. <laughs> um, I experienced a, le- a, right-handed, a right cheek slap a few months ago. I'm not sure of the date. I was on the subway, and when I'm on the T, I, I'm usually doing some work on my computer. I was either writing a computer program or writing a string quartet arrangement. I don't remember what I do. I mean, you know, that's my life. And I noticed across the top car on the other side, was a young man, young white guy, about 25 maybe, stretched out across three, uh, three seats, and he was out. I kind of got the impression he was drunk. He was just in another dimension. And I didn't pay him any mind, and I got to work. A few minutes later, I looked up, and this dude is staring at me with the most unfriendly smile I have ever seen in my life and he's given me the finger and 30 years ago I probably wouldn't have been phased because that was what people of color experienced normally in the city of Boston but it's been a while since that's been normal for me and no I did not respond in kind I don't give people the finger I just don't do that And it was very clear that he was not interested in a physical confrontation or a verbal one, and neither was I. But there it was, a slap to the right cheek, ultimate disrespect. And I share that because I want to make it really clear that we're in a place right now where that's happening a lot. Sometimes it's happening very violently, like it did in Pittsburgh, or with the pipe bombs that were mailed. And sometimes it's just disrespect. And for people of color, people like me, we're experiencing it at a level that has not been the case for a long time. Whether waiting at Starbucks for a friend or trying to fly to London or walking on Grapevine Road or trying to do some work in the subway. There's been a rash of disrespect. And I say that in solidarity with those my, my folks of color, and say, we're going through a tough time. And it's really hard not to want to lash out. And I just want to acknowledge that, that it's difficult. And I say that to my white brothers and sisters, because you need to know this is what's going on for us right now. And you need to stand with us against this tide. And if anybody wants to talk to me further about that, my office is about 400 miles away that way. Um, feel free to join me. But it's hard to turn the other cheek, isn't it? When you're dissed like that, like I was. So in the next passage, Jesus says, love your enemies. And the the, the expression had been, love your neighbor and hate your enemies. That hate your enemies part, that that ain't in the Bible. That ain't in there. That's right about the same passage where God helps those who help themselves. Or cleanliness is next to godliness. Um... It ain't in there. But it seemed to be a norm in the society that Jesus was talking to. And it is something that is a normal thing to want to do. But let's look at what that means to us right now. We have a list of people we call friends. We don't usually keep an enemies list. Maybe some of you do. I don't. You know, you can't go on Facebook and enemy somebody. That would be a bad feature. Can you, can you see how that would play out? And you see your friend as an enemy of your friend. Oh, no, no, no. Zuckerberg, don't do that, right? There's a reason why we don't do that. But let me suggest a couple of people who might be enemies. The first group, very quickly, are people who are temporarily in an adversarial relationship. How many of you here have ever had a roommate? How many have ever been frustrated with your roommate? How many are awkwardly sitting next to that roommate? I'm so <laughs> Should have seen that coming. Sorry about that, y'all. How many folks here are like me are married? How many married folks we got in here? Anybody? 
How many married folks have been frustrated with their spouse at one time? How many people need to work on their lying? Um, <laughs> anybody that you're in an ongoing relationship with at some point is going to tick you off. And in that moment, you're not really focusing on spreading the love of Jesus. Right? You want to make sure they know what they just done did to you. In no uncertain terms. In that moment, I would submit they're your enemy. I pray it don't last. Um, or it could be that person who cut you off in traffic. The one who cut in line in front of you. Or that dude on the subway. People that we're just going to bump into, never see again, but in that moment, we want to tell them all about themselves. That might be an enemy. Or it might be someone that you have an ongoing grudge with. Someone that you, you have a conflict or you know that they have with you. You'd be at a party or a reception, having a great time, your friends are there, and then they walk in. And your face turns to bright and sunny to dark and stormy night. You know what I'm talking about? And you might as well just leave because your night's ruined because they showed up. If you're thinking of somebody right now, that would be somebody I would call your enemy. Or it may be something more impersonal, like groups of people. Like people who are different from you. Keeping it real. There is not a woman in this room who has not been abused by a man in some way. It's true, and I regret that, and I, as a man, say I'm sorry deeply, but it's true. And it could be very easy for women to see all men as enemies. I could understand that. The same could be said about the racial situation. Um, or it may be people who think politically different than you do. People who are on another wing from the wing you're on. Or are just so extreme in how they, they share that that you feel like, I can't stand being with those people. I can't even talk to them. Jesus talked about, if you only greet people like you, what's up with that? Can you say, hey, how are you doing? Glad to see you, even though you couldn't believe what they just posted last night. Can you do that? Maybe that's your enemy. Or maybe, and I can't get into this, maybe the enemy is yourself. And there are ways that you Mistreat, abuse, disrespect yourself. I don't know who your enemy is, but I hope that help, is helpful just to think through some possibility, possible um, people that might apply to. But let me tell you what loving your enemies isn't. First of all, loving your enemy is not remaining in abuse. It is not staying in that situation. If that guy on the subway had started to verbally threaten me or engage me in another way, I would have had every right to get up and move to another car or to get MBTA personnel to help me out. I was not obligated to stay in abuse. And if you're in a situation like that, it doesn't mean you have to sit there. It also doesn't mean that you have to extend trust to someone who doesn't deserve it. We are to love everybody. We are not to trust everybody. If someone has proven themselves unreliable, has consistently betrayed you, you should not place yourself in a position where they can continue to damage you. That's not loving your enemies. Um, it also doesn't mean avoiding unresolved conflict. If you've got a situation that I described at that party, you need to take care of that. Loving your enemies isn't saying, ah, it's okay, because it's not okay. And you need to resolve it as best you can. And finally, loving your enemies is not ignoring systemic injustice. It's not ignoring that. It's also not failing to stand up for the rights of others. You know, there are other people on that subway. They could have done something. They chose not to. And we need to look at ways that we can love those who are being abused having their right cheeks or left cheeks slapped. 
So loving your enemies is none of those things. Let me give you some practical tips of what it might be, though. Let's say I am mad at somebody. That temporary situation, whether it's your roommate, spouse, what I try to do is I try to remember the things I love about that person. I hate doing that. You know, when my wife ticks me off once a year, (laughs) because she's perfect, um, I try to remember the, the reasons why I married her. That doesn't mean I don't deal with the fact that I really didn't appreciate what you just did, but I try to remember that so that when I come to her, I have that as my, my context. Um, and also, I try to remember the times when I've been a jerk. If someone followed with the camera of my driving, oh man, that would be embarrassing. There have been times where I cut somebody off, or I ran that red light because I wasn't, because I was too busy preparing a sermon. You know, we've all been that jerk. Some of you today right? And so remembering that helps me deal with the person that I'm absolutely furious with. Looking at the political landscape or the sort of the impersonal one, God says to pray for those who persecute us. That means we need to pray for people whose opinion is radically different than ours. And, you know, every um, Friday I pray for civic leaders. I pray for my mayor. I pray for my governor. I pray for our president. I pray for um, representatives in Congress, I pray for civic leaders, whoever God puts on my heart. And it is tempting to pray, God, knock some sense into that fool. <laughs> or, please, embarrass them and have a scandal so they get knocked out of office. Or, or something, and, and I'm trying not to pray that. I'm trying to pray, God, I don't know what your will is for this person, but I pray that the sun would shine on them. I pray that they would know you. I pray that they would hear from you. I pray that you would help them to do your will. And I do that kicking and screaming. Because it's really hard to do that. Tuesdays, today, I pray for national Christian leaders. And I pray for those who are aligned with my values and those who have values that are very distinctly different from mine. And again, it's really hard to not pray that God change them to be more like me. But I just pray that God touch them in whatever way he chooses. That's hard, isn't it? Y'all didn't like that, did you? But that's, that's a way that we can actually do what Jesus is saying here. And I used to have in my lexicon an expression, typical white man. And I realized there was nothing godly about that. That had to go. Now, I'm not at the place where I don't think that, I'll be honest. But I no longer allow myself to enjoy thinking that. And I don't put that in the atmosphere. I need to treat everybody as a person as I would like to be treated. And to love everybody as a person that God loves. Oh, that's hard, isn't it? Another story. Another right cheek slap. Um, this one has a happy ending. I'll give, you that. I'll give you that now. When I first got here at Gordon, very few of you in the room remember what it was like. It wasn't pretty. Um, and um, I'm going to be real. For my first semester here, one of the most fun campus activities was using social media to take pot shots at me. That's just absolutely true. It was just the in thing to do. And through Twitter and through Facebook and other social media, I took some really major slaps. And I was on uh, overheard at Gordon on Facebook, and someone took a slap at me. And it was mean. But at this point, I felt led to do something, so I private messaged the person and said, saw your comment. Can we talk? And to his credit, he said, you know what? I'm really sorry. That was really mean. I was trying to get a laugh. I apologize. He took the comment down. I said, thank you, but can we talk? Because I want to talk to him about what he said. And within an hour, he was in my office. And we talked for two hours. And we heard each other. And we listened. 
And he became a friend. Through the remaining years while he was at Gordon, we were always happy to see each other. That's what Jesus wants to have happen. That's the stuff. And yeah, Jesus in me was doing something. And I'm grateful that God was able to give me his character to do that. But i got to give this guy credit too. He responded in a godly fashion. The Jesus in me loved the Jesus in him. And I'm sorry, but it wasn't easy. But it happened. And that's my prayer that it happens for us. It goes at the end of this passage. It says, be perfect like God is perfect. And it's like, are you serious? I mean, but it's not talking about perfect like Sarita Kwok, violin concerto perfect. <laughs> oh, I wish. It's more talking about, yo, be Jesus up in here. Be Jesus in this place. Act like Jesus would if he was here. When my son was little, he would meet somebody. He would say, what kind of man is that? What kind of? He's trying to get the essence of that person. What kind of man are you? What kind of woman are you? I want to be the kind of person that makes people think of Jesus. That reminds me of of the Lord. That's kind of what what God would would do. Um, Eugene, the late Eugene Peterson in the message said it this way. In a word, what I am saying is, grow up! You are kingdom subjects. Now live like it. Live out your God-created identity. Live generously and graciously to others the way God lives toward you. Here's the punchline. Jesus told us to love our enemies. And that's unreasonable. And that's hard. Except we've got to remember this. We were all his enemies. And he loved us. We were his enemies. And he loved us. Let me leave you with this. Lord, I want to be a Christian in my heart, in my heart. Lord, I want to be a Christian in my heart, in my heart. Lord, I want to be a Christian in my heart. Lord, I want to be more loving in my heart, in my heart. Lord, I want to be more loving in my heart. Lord, I want to be more loving in my heart. Lord, I want to be like Jesus in my heart, in my heart. Lord, I want to be like Jesus in my heart,
Go and love the hell out of people. Thank you.